Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Palestinians at the UN. The case for statehood and the ensuing fight to control the story. The militant Islamic storm that threatens us. South Africa and the media, the racial undertones in the coverage of the country's politics. The Syrian government can crack down on protesters, but who's watching the hackers? Let's go. And it's party time in Pyongyang, our web video of the week. The art of diplomacy is usually conducted behind closed doors. At the recent gathering of world leaders at the United Nations, however, the cameras were rolling and the world was able to watch. For Palestinians, it was a critical media moment. Mahmoud Abbas was at the podium, bidding for recognition of Palestine as the UN's newest member state. The Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, spoke as well. Two leaders, two different visions. And the resulting coverage revealed as much about the politics of the media as it did about the geopolitics being played out at the UN. Trying to affect the coverage was the well-oiled Israeli media machine versus Palestinian spin doctors. They were both marketing their version of the way forward in the Middle East. Our starting point this week is a world away from the disputed territories of Palestine and Israel. We begin in New York City and the coverage of the diplomatic showdown at the United Nations. This was definitely a sort of media battle, the battle at the UN. Real diplomatic crisis over the Palestinian bid for statehood. The popular media was covering the whole initiative as a zero-sum game. If they win, we lose. It's like, uh, it was like, like uh, a football match. This is not just a political event. It was a political PR, a speech that was heard around the world. For any politician speaking through the cameras, it's not just what you say that matters, and it's not just how you say it. It is how you look when you say it. He had an advantage, Netanyahu, over Abbas even before they walked into the hall of the General Assembly. Israel has extended its hand in peace. First of all, the delivery of Netanyahu was much better than delivery of Abbas because his English is fluent, Abbas spoke in Arabic. <laughs> the metaphors Netanyahu used to make his points were more familiar to the Western public, to the people that he wanted to convince, the, the American and the European audiences. The militant Islamic storm that threatens us? He looked like one of them. However, Mahmoud Abbas also looked like one of them, not compared to Benjamin Netanyahu, compared to Abbas's predecessor. What was interesting here was the juxtaposition of Mahmoud Abbas, moderate, dressed in a suit, versus uh, years before Yasser Arafat. So it was not just a speech, it was an end of an era and the beginning of an era. It was a changing dynamic of the negotiations and using the pulpit of the UN as the, basically the, the point of, of change. When Chairman Arafat spoke at the UN, he was dressed as a military man. President Abbas came very different. He came first dressed in a suit, he came dressed uh, in a Western clothes. <laughs> He talked very clearly against violence. He said that violence is not a choice that Palestinians have at the moment. If you come in dressed as a military man nowadays, you're right away associated as, uh, as a terrorist, and that's not the way Palestinians want it to be uh, perceived. And in the electronic age, it is not just the speech that counts. Often, it is what follows the speech. In the days following the speeches, you do see that there has been an attempt by uh, the Israeli Public Relations Department to affect the way global media covered those speeches. The Israelis were in every media outlet across the country. I mean, you had Charlie Rose, you had Need the Press, you had Wolf Blitzer. For 18 years we've been negotiating peace. You had Prime Minister Netanyahu going around to the international media to defend Israel and in many ways I think unfortunately the international media felt the need to defend Israel here and gave it a podium much more than it gave the Palestinians to explain their point and why they're going to the UN. 
One of the more contentious pieces of journalism was related to Mahmoud Abbas's speech. It was produced by the world's largest news agency, AP, and came out of AP's bureau in Jerusalem. What it claimed was a fact check is in fact a sort of attempt to bring in the Israeli side of the narrative as a critique of Abbas. So for example, it said um, the speech, uh, Abbas claimed he wanted two states. The facts, he didn't mention the right of uh, Israel as a Jewish people to the state, that Abbas, by saying that Palestinian prisoners were political prisoners, was avoiding the fact that they had been involved in violence. And in, in each of these, it sounded more like an answer to Abbas's points by using the Israeli talk points in response, rather than something more like a fact check. It was an opinion check. Basically, what they did is compared the, the speech of President Abbas to the, the Israeli narrative. It was not about what's true, it was does Abbas's speech fit with the Israeli narrative? And if it doesn't, then it's not facts and it's uh, made up. That's a challenge Palestinians have of how to communicate our narrative, our story, uh, in a place where the Israeli narrative is taken as full facts. AP, which did not fact check Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech, is influential. It feeds news to more than 1,400 newspapers in the US alone, as well as websites and other electronic news media, including Al Jazeera. We asked the AP to comment to ensure we got the facts right. There was no reply. Better a bad press than a good eulogy. And better still would be a fair press. Benjamin Netanyahu is acutely aware of the media's role in this story, even mentioning them in his speech. He may have been referring to the New York Times, usually a strong supporter of Israel. This time, the paper was critical of Netanyahu's speech before and after it was delivered through one of the Times' most widely read columnists, Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman stressed that coming and performing cannot replace the fact uh, that without Netanyahu doing something in the direction of uh, the two-state solution, there was not going to be any way in which the world would believe that Netanyahu actually wants a two-state solution whereas Abbas was in favor of uh, the two-state solution, which is the position, the declared position of the United States, of the European Union, and certainly of the United Nations. And, and that's why no matter how much fireworks were used, there wasn't much chance um, of Netanyahu winning this one. Whereas in some ways, Netanyahu's Palestinian counterpart had very little to lose when he walked into the media spotlight at the UN. President Arafat, years ago said that uh, if the Palestinian case disappears from public attention, then we are gone, then there is no Palestinian case and we have lost the fight. And so it's been always something that Palestinians struggled for, to keep the Palestinian issue on a global level, to make sure that it's on the news. Some of Mahmoud Abbas's message may have been lost in translation. He did not get as much face time as his political rival and there have been complaints about the coverage. But at least there was coverage. And that, for the Palestinian leader, is the main thing. Our Global Village Voice is now on the coverage of Palestine, Israel, and the UN. The Washington Post editorialized that the Palestinian bid was, quote unquote, a heedless rush for statehood. But Palestinians have been waiting more than 63 years to redress the injustices of the Nakba. My question to the editorial writers of the Washington Post is how much longer are Palestinians supposed to wait to achieve their long denied rights? The New York Times editorial board claimed that President Obama had no choice but to stand by Israel and veto Palestinian statehood. This is preposterous because clearly Obama does have a choice. The biased U.S. media is as much to blame for the oppression of the Palestinian people as are the Israel lobby and the U.S. government. The Palestinian bid for statehood was definitely a major story in Israeli media. The big narratives were how Obama was finally a good boy and he finally proved that he was on our side. Right, there was this, this article in the Jerusalem Post calling him a good Jerusalem boy. If you've got an opinion on the news media that you'd like to get on the air as one of our Global Village voices, we suggest you join the thousands of our viewers who already follow us on Facebook and Twitter. They go to those sites to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in, or you can just email us at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The British courts are filling up with cases related to the phone hacking scandal at Rupert Murdoch's News of the World. 
Andy Coulson, the former editor at the paper, who went on to work at 10 Downing Street under Prime Minister David Cameron, is suing his former news bosses for breach of contract. Coulson edited the News of the World when some of the worst of the hacking is alleged to have taken place. He was arrested back in July on suspicion of corruption and illegal hacking. He's currently out on bail. Coulson's now suing News Group Papers, a subsidiary of Murdoch's News International, after they stopped paying his legal fees. A spokesman for the legal firm acting for Coulson confirmed that proceedings have been issued. News International declined to make a comment on that. Syria has been battling anti-government demonstrators on the streets. Now the government's taking some hits online from hackers. Activists hacked their way into a number of Syrian government websites and openly mocked the authorities there. The Ministry of Culture's site suddenly had this video showing an activist, a singer, who had his throat slashed. Another video showed a cartoonist who had his hands broken. A few groups, including Anonymous and Revolusec, claimed responsibility for the breach. This interactive map popped up on various government sites purporting to show the number of people killed since protests began in March. There was this message on the Ministry of Transport site saying don't let Bashar monitor you online, a response to the Assad government's attempts to silence online protests. One of those groups, Revolusec, followed the hacking by taunting the government on Twitter. We hear that Syrian President Assad likes computers. Guess what? So do we. Journalists in Mexico have received another chilling warning from drug cartels. The decapitated body of Maria Elizabeth Macias Castro was found in Nuevo Laredo, the same city where two citizen journalists were killed just two weeks ago. Macias Castro was a news editor at a daily paper, Primera Hora. She wrote regularly about criminal groups in the area and corruption but it was her reports on Twitter and the website Nuevo Laredo en Vivo in which she wrote under a pseudonym that caught the eye of the cartels. Her killers left a note near the body saying that Macias Castro's writing on those sites led to her murder. Seven journalists have been killed in Mexico this year. The New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists condemned the murder, saying, This wave of unprecedented violence is endangering the constitutional rights of all Mexicans to freedom of expression and access to information. One of Britain's biggest broadcasters has apologized after airing a documentary that featured a clip from a computer game passed off as real-life video. More than a million viewers tuned in to watch ITV One's new investigative current affairs program, Exposure, Gaddafi and the IRA. The show looked at former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's links to the Irish Republican paramilitary group. Gaddafi's weapons had upped the ante. The show also included video that was said to show the IRA taking down a helicopter with weapons supplied by the Gaddafi regime. It was possible to shoot down a helicopter, as the terrorists' own footage of 1988 shows. However, fans of a military game set in a fictional post-Soviet country spotted the mistake, and ITV1 was forced to apologize. Their spokesman said, the events featured in Exposure, Gaddafi and the IRA were genuine, but it would appear that during the editing process, the correct clip of the 1988 incident was not selected and other footage was mistakenly included. The CEO of the game's producer, Marek Spanel, said, It is very weird to see our game used this way. Rare is the day in South Africa when Julius Malema is not in the news. Malema heads the youth wing of the ruling African National Congress Party. Stories of his inflammatory rhetoric, court hearings for hate speech, and a suspiciously extravagant lifestyle have him in the headlines so often that Malema's supporters accuse newspapers there of an aggressive anti-Malema agenda. Complicating the issue is the fact that most newspapers belong to companies that are owned by white South Africans. Then there's the country's state-owned broadcaster, the SABC, where most South Africans actually get their news, and where, relative to the print sector, the coverage of the government and politicians is much more tame. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on Julius Malema, the South African media, and the race issue lurking in the background. Watch the media in South Africa and it's evident President Jacob Zuma is the biggest newsmaker in the country. Watch a little closer and you'll see close on his heels is Julius Malema. Young, brash and a media magnet, Malema makes good copy. Don't come here 
with that white tendency. Not he has a history of singing an ANC revolutionary song with the lyric, kill the boer, kill the farmer. These are ANC songs. There's his cozy relationship with Zimbabwean president Robert Mugabe, and he praises the land reforms there, a policy white Zimbabweans called land grabs. But City Press, a leading weekly newspaper, doesn't just report Mr. Malema's antics, it investigates the man and how he lives. There's always been a mystery around Mr. Malema's wealth. He's a youth league leader of the ruling party, earning about 40,000 rand, which is less than, which is about $5,000 per month. Now, Mr. Malema lives a very high life. He lives a life of flashy cars, very smart clothes, very expensive watches. And it's never been clear to us how he's been able to afford and sustain this lifestyle. A straightforward story, but the paper got some blowback. Although it's aimed at a black readership, City Press is published by Media24, a subsidiary of NASPERS, a company that had close ties to the NP, the political party that introduced and eventually ended apartheid. And when the paper published a story alleging that Mr. Malema was benefiting from illegal payments into a secret trust fund, the paper and its editor, Fereel Hafaji, came under attack. Saying that Fereel Hafaji serves white masters is, is as literal as you can get. Whoever pays your salary is your master. She works for a newspaper that is owned by Naspers, a white company that was built under apartheid. That's her master, in my opinion. And as much as she thinks she might be free, I guarantee you, the day she does what they don't like, they will fire her. Eric Mignani claims that's what happened to him. He was fired by the black owners of the Sowetan newspaper when he wrote a column accusing Ms. Hafiji of being a black snake in the grass, deployed by white capital to sow discord amongst black South Africans. Many South Africans, both black and white, viewed the column as a hit piece without merit. But I think it's a very crude view to think that, that journalists have no independence, simply behave at the whim of those who own the media, certainly the commercial media was traditionally owned by whites. But I'm not sure that ownership is the most critical factor here. I think we know that commercial media in an open society as ours is, doesn't operate that crudely. And the private media is always a soft target for that kind of criticism, that we are white owned, that we only cater for a certain sector of society. I would say that is not true. If you look at a company like ours, we have black directors on our board, we have a black female editor of our newspaper, and we're passionate about transformation and we're passionate about fairness. And I think in this investigation especially, we have been fair on Mr. Malema and we have given him and his supporters plenty of space in our newspaper, on our opinion pages and on our news pages to also air their views. Julius Malema is not the only public figure who bears the brunt of print media investigations. Top policeman General Becky Kele was ousted after a print investigation claimed he awarded a lucrative lease deal for a new police headquarters to a personal friend. It was print media that revealed President Jacob Zuma had a child outside of wedlock despite being married to three women. And there was a series of print investigations called Zuma Incorporated that claimed the president's family was abusing his position to secure state deals. On the airwaves, it's a bit of a different world. Coverage tends to avoid controversial issues on channels like the state broadcaster, the SABC, where most South Africans get their news. Morning live on SABC2, good morning. And the government and the ruling party have a lot of say in, uh, in what goes uh, into what they broadcast uh, or uh, who gets into what positions. So there are limitations, self-imposed even limitations, on how they report, report the news. It's become a bit of a platform to politicians to just say what they want to say without being really probed. Looming in the background of the debate is the ruling ANC that frequently accuses the media, especially print media, of sensationalistic and unsubstantiated reporting. The government has two pieces of legislation in the pipeline. One, that would replace self-regulation of the media with statutory regulation. The second, which has just been shelved but not dismissed, would give the state the power to classify information and jail journalists simply for being in its possession, not even publishing it. If the Protection of Information Bill gets passed, it holds a grave concern for investigative journalism 
Um, it will deter whistleblowers from coming to us because they could also go to prison for leaking these documents to us. It will deter journalists from really doing these stories, from digging deep to get to the truth of matters where they had to access classified information. The call for a statutory media tribunal, I have little doubt, is an attempt to contain and muzzle the media and its criticism of the government. I think there is a reasonable call to review our self uh, regulation and ask whether it's independent and effective enough. I think around the world people are asking that, particularly after the recent News of the World scandal in Britain. Media are supposed to reflect the country they cover. South Africa is no exception. The country has gone through a political revolution, but the social revolution is yet to occur. Most of the country's wealth belongs to a white minority or relatively small black elite. And as long as the country remains socially divided, then that will manifest in the media. There is a negative agenda in South Africa's print media. Uh, and my view is that it is because it is essentially white. What that comes with is a fear of losing privilege. And that privilege today is money. So for me, the negative agenda is fueled by the fear that if blacks have, I will ha not have. If blacks have, I will lose. Our most pressing issues are inequality, unemployment, poverty, and those voices are seldom heard or seen in most of our media. So my concern, what, you know, while the government's concern has been about the raucous and irritating voices it hears, um, my greater concern is for the voices, the very important voices we don't hear. Because if those voices continue to feel marginalized by society and the media, then it will only make voices of radical politicians like Julius Malema grow louder. More Global Village voices now on news coverage in South Africa. Not all media in South Africa focus on Julius Malema. It's only a few of them. But those that do tend to divert the attention from real, impo real important issues that need engagement and robust debate. Does our print media have a common agenda? Certainly not. To suggest so is, is to not understand the South African print media context. Is there a challenge and around how they portray government? Yes, there probably is. Is there sufficient diversity? No, I don't think so. But how do we address that is the key question. Our media is subject to the same kinds of challenges as media around the world. The way to address these issues is to try and improve media quality, not to limit media freedom. Finally, it would be a challenge to come up with two more disparate cultures than North Korea and the dance clubs of the world outside Pyongyang, but that's what mashups are for. A London-based architecture student named Finbar Fallon spotted a few similarities. He decided that North Korea's goose-stepping military and its traditional dancers could teach the rest of the world a thing or two. So he took one of this year's biggest club hits, Party Rock Anthem, and he mashed it up with scenes from Kim Jong-il's birthday celebrations and one of North Korea's biggest festivals. And presto, a collective dance force, well-armed with some pretty good moves. Would the dear leader approve? With nearly a million hits online, that doesn't really matter. This is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. Every day I'm shuffling. In the club, party ride. Right. Looking for your girl, she on my jock, huh? Now stop when we in the spot. Booty moving weight like she on the block. With a drink, I got to know. Tight jeans, tattoo, cause I'm rock, rock. Half black, half white, diamond, no. Gang of money, open up. Yeah, I'm running through these halls like Drano. I got that devilish flow, rock and roll, no halo. We party. Party rock is in the house tonight. Everybody just have a good time. Everybody just have a good time